dreams, wounded hearts, and broken toys. Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus, and He will turn your sorrow into joy. Yes, He will turn your sorrow into joy. And it's probably too late now Oh, but I don't worry about that much Cause I'm happy anyhow As I go along life's journey I'm reaping better that I've sown I'm drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed Ain't got a lot of riches Sometimes the going's rough But I've got a friend in Jesus And that makes me rich enough I thank God for all His blessings on me And the mercy that He's bestowed I'm drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed You know, my friend, sometimes sadness and sorrow come our way and we just can't seem to control what happens to us. But you know what? When we're at our lowest is when we need to reach up and touch his nail-scarred hand he said he'd be faithful to reach down, pick us up, and restore us to new. Aren't you thankful for that today? So Lord, help me not to grumble and complain About the tough roads I have owned I'm drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed. Well, happy Sabbath, church family. How was your week? Was it wonderful in the Lord? Amen, amen. Well, we want to start off our worship service with praise. We know that God loves music, and we know that because he tells us in Zephaniah, is it 317? What does he tell us in that verse? Anybody know? He sings over us. Amen. Amen. And so it, it, it behooves us. I like that old English word. It behooves us to sing back to him, to sing with him, to praise him for his goodness towards the children of man, that's you and me. So this morning, let us start our praise by singing number 322, Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. Savior, not of this 
interesting in that second verse where it says nothing between like worldly pleasure habits of life though harmless they seem that really got me as I was singing there so many times the things that we love to do we're thinking oh it's not so bad nothing between amen amen let's flip on over to 329 Take the world, but please give me Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love.
for leading out on our song service morning. Oh, the height and depth of mercy. What a blessing. What a blessing we received from the Lord. And we have sunshine today. We haven't seen that in a while. For you that are watching on live stream, we're glad that you've taken the time to come to spend time with us and join us for our service this morning and here in the Wildwood Church. Uh, we had some talk this morning in Sabbath school about healing for different people. And we had a couple that were members in Rutland. They uh, have moved to California. They've attended our church, Jove and Marvin Pinder. Yeah. And if you remember them, well, Marvin uh, has a case of Parkinson's, I believe it is. And anyhow, he is under uh, special treatment they are, are, are trying down there. And they've implanted something in his brain. Mm -hmm. And just recently, they've turned... The way he described it, they've turned the power on a little bit. First step. Yep. First step. He no more stoops when he walks. His, 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 he's, he's, he doesn't stumble. And there was a couple other things that have dramatically changed within the first. His tremors have all but gone. And medication has been cut. Yeah, and his medication has been cut in half. So there are miracles that the good Lord is bestows upon us if we trust in him. And we uh, mentioned this morning in Sabbath school about different cares and concerns. So I've chosen for our call to worship this morning. It comes from the book of Isaiah. And if you have the Bible handy and you want to turn to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to go to chapter 53. So I'll just give you a moment, a moment to go there. It's nice to hear the rustling of pages. Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to scroll down to verse 5. And there it says, but, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Amen. What a promise. Amen. I've asked Brother Paul if he'd have our opening prayer this morning. <clears throat> Our Father, as we come before you this morning, we think of in our mind that wonderful throne room in heaven, so huge that we can hardly imagine its size. And there you are before us, our God, our Creator, our wonderful God that is love. When we think of what has happened on this world and the problems that have developed because of sin, oh, how we want to see the change. We want to see the eternal life that could have been ours if this had never happened. As we think on those things, Lord, we are so grateful that you sent Jesus he came at great risk. Yes. One sin, one small mistake could have blown the whole plan. And yet he knew that he would make it. He knew that it would happen because you promised it would. And so here we are today. We're just able to receive that gift we're just so grateful that Jesus came and went through what he did. And we realize that although Satan threw all kinds of terrible things at him, the worst of all, the cross itself, that was not the real 
problem for Jesus. For Jesus, the problem was in Gethsemane, facing that eternal death that is the wages of sin for us, that we might have freedom to live and to become eternal lives for you. Oh, Father, if only we could share this with the people around us. Help us, give us boldness to speak a word in season so that people might be able to become a part of this truth that will give them freedom and security that they have eternal life. The gospel is so simple. You gave your only begotten Son that we might be able to live eternally. Oh, my Father, as we think on these things, we want to worship you, and that's what we're here for. We come together not just for association together and sharing together, but to worship you. And we are here looking to you this morning with all our questions and all our problems, and we cast our care upon you because we know you care for us. So as we are here today, Father, help us to truly worship you, to care for those around us, and to love as you love. And we name it in the name of Jesus. Amen. As Paul was praying there about the throne room, I thought, singing to God in that throne room. So as we sing our opening song, number 27, I invite you to have the picture of the throne room of God, and you are in it, singing to your creator today. I pray that you will have that picture and that you will sing accordingly. Let's stand as we sing number 27, Rejoice, ye pure in heart.
you so much. And thank you to our young musicians. Thank you. It's now time to take up the offering. And the offering this morning is for the BC REACH program put on by the conference. And we'll ask the deacons to come forward at this time. We thank you for your many blessings. And as we studied in Sabbath school this morning, the obligation of us to turn, return our tithes and offerings back to you, to they may be enhanced your cause, to spread the gospel throughout the world, which would hasten your soon return. We ask for your blessing upon these offerings, that you would multiply them to your use. This we pray in Jesus' most holy and precious name, above all names, amen. We are once again blessed this morning to have Beverly and Randy Haynes here. Beverly's going to share with us our special music this morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sweet home. 
to peace me at my father's throne may come my wants and wishes known in a season of distress and grief And oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet of prayer, sweet of prayer. from a world of care to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and the On him, my every care, and wait for thee, sweet hour of To him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless, sweet Till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight in a mile.
Thank you, Beverly, for that beautiful rendition of Sweet Hour of Prayer. I've been blessed already. How about you? I've asked Sister Kylie if she would share with us a scripture reading this morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, I'll be sharing three verses today. The first one is Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Thank you, Sister Connie. We're blessed to have Brother Randy Haynes here this morning to share us the message, and he's going to expound on those verses from Malachi. Thank you, Randy, for coming. Well, good morning, church family. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord on this beautiful sunny Sabbath day? My wife and I are truly blessed to be uh, with all of you, our brothers and sisters, and, and we praise God with you. Today we'll be studying an issue which I consider to be one of the most important issues facing Adventism today, and a subject that I believe is extremely crucial to understand correctly, especially in these final days of Earth's history. The subject I am speaking of is number 18 of our 28 fundamental beliefs, the gift of prophecy. And I will be um, quote some of my sermon, and I'll be quoting a little bit from an um, amazing article by Dennis Preby. Um, so that really goes in depth into the subject. So if any, guys, if any, if any of you want to go even more in depth, uh, talk to me afterwards, and I'll share that with you. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to pray one more time. We can't pray enough, can we? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as I come before you, I confess my sins and acknowledge that there is nothing good in me. I have no wisdom. I have no strength. But Lord, you are full of wisdom and full of strength. And so, Lord, I pray that you will strengthen me with might through your spirit now and that you will surround this building with angels that excel in strength and that you'll cast out any evil spirits that are within this building right now that are wanting to distract us, that are wanting to deceive us. Lord, may... I only speak in spirit and in truth now. Please, Lord, I pray for each person that is here. I lift each one up before you. And I pray that you will soften each one of our hearts to hear the message that you have for each one of us, including me today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we as Adventists understand the gift of prophecy to be one of the identifying marks of the remnant church spoken of in the book of Revelation. We arrived at this understanding when we, when we read Revelation 12 or 17, where it says that the remnant are those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Then by letting scripture interpret scripture, we next turn to Revelation 19 verse 10, and read that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then we use these verses to conclude that the the gift of prophecy would be manifested 
in the last day remnant church and more specifically in the writings of Ellen G. White. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to puzzle a bit over that phrase that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I didn't understand very well how those two phrases were connected to each other. So after doing a bunch of study on this, this is how it makes more sen makes sense to me. It is the testimony that originates with Jesus and is revealed to his church through the prophets. So let me just say that again. It is a testimony that originates with Jesus and is revealed by the Holy Spirit to his church through the prophets. Does that make it clear to you? Now, in recent years especially, many questions have been raised relating to the proper function of Ellen White's writings. What relation do her writings bear to the Bible? Was everything she wrote inspired? How inspired was she? Does she have doctrinal authority? So, and what is, the pro what is proper and what is improper in using her writings? Uh, there, have all, there have been many questions regard. There have been many questions regarding the writings of Ellen White, and there have also been many widely differing conclusions of her writings. Some have concluded that her writings are as authoritative as that of any other prophet of God throughout history. Some say that her writings are a lesser light, and that her and and thus are optional for us, and that we are free to pick and choose what we want to pay attention to. Some say that they were written for her time and culture and don't apply to us today. Some say that because she never claimed to be a prophet, that her writings are no more inspired than that of any other Christian. And others even conclude that she was a fake and a great con, con artist. First of all, I would like to point out that the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially believes that God has given divine inspiration to Ellen White. We do not mean by this that it was by occasional prophetic utterances, but that she claims that she was guided by the Holy Spirit her entire life. So to begin to answer these questions, I would like to now take you way back in time, all the way back to the time of Moses, over 3,400 years ago. Moses, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the books Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as well as Job, according to Jewish tradition. At that time, these were the only books that were considered to be inspired. Later on, as various people came forward claiming to be prophets of God and writing books that they claimed were to be inspired of God, the things they said and wrote were then tested by those books that were already acknowledged to be inspired. For the example, the book of Isaiah was tested by all of the books already considered inspired. The book of Jeremiah, which came later, was tested by all of those same books, plus the book of Isaiah. And then when we get to the New, New Testament times, the books of Paul, for instance, were tested by all of the books of the Old and, sorry, of all the, books of the Old Testament. <laughs> so each successive prophet was, cons was always tested by the writings of all the preceding prophets that were considered inspired. There were also quite a number of prophets of God mentioned in the Bible whose words and writings are not recorded in the Bible. So does that mean that they were less inspired than the prophets whose writings were included in the Bible? Does that mean that they spoke with less, less or no prophetic authority? Does that mean that the people were then free to ignore or pick and choose the words they re that these prophets had received from God? Of course not, right? If God gave them messages for the people, these were messages directly from God and must be heeded. So now let us apply this to Ellen White. If she was indeed inspired of God, as she claimed to be, would her writings not be just as inspired as all the prophets that came before her? And wouldn't it only be logical that her writings would have to be tested by all of the inspired writings contained in the Old and New Testaments? 
Now with these assertions, some will protest that we are then making her writings equal to the, the Bible, but that is not the case at all. Her writings are to be tested by the Bible and not the other way around. However, just because Ellen White's writings are not equal to the Bible and not part of the canon, does that mean that she has any less authority than the canonical prophets? What about Elijah and Elisha and John the Baptist? They were not part of the canon, were they? But were they authoritative? The authority of them, this is key, listen carefully. The authority of a prophetic message depends upon revelation and inspiration, not canonicity. A very important principle to understand is that a writing is canonized because it is authoritative. It is not authoritative because it is canonized. So the question is not if Ellen White is equal to the Bible and canonical, but is she authoritative? When it comes to being a prophet of God, there are not varying degrees of inspiration. One is either receiving messages from God or they are not. And in the case of Ellen White, because her visions were accompanied by supernatural phenomena impossible to counterfeit and witnessed by many people, it is impossible to dismiss her writings as just her own ideas. Thus, her visions had to come either from God or from Satan. Either her visions are genuine or they are masterpieces of deception and should be shunned as coming from Satan. No other option is open for one who claims a prophetic gift and has experienced the physical phenomena that Ellen, which Ellen White did. In fact, she herself states that her visions come either from God or from Satan. Thus, we must accept or reject the messenger as a whole. Let us now look at some of the claims made by Ellen White. So this is, uh, boy, not, Call Porter Ministry, page 125. Sister White is not the originator of these books. They contain the instruction that during her life work, God has been giving her. They contain the precious comforting light that God has graciously given his servant to be given to the world. In the next one, in Fifth, Test uh, Fifth Testimonies, page 67, I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely mine own ideas. So pay attention to that very carefully. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Yes. And here's another quote. Weak and trembling, I arose at three o'clock in the morning to write to you. God was speaking through clay. You might say that this communication was only a letter. Notice that now it's talking about a letter that she wrote. Yes, it was a letter, but prompted by the Spirit of God to bring before your minds things that have been shown me. In these letters which I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. Now, of course, I want to clarify, of course, she wrote letters to her husband or to her children that were just about common things. We're not talking about that, but when she was writing to other brothers and sisters, um, she was, they were messages from God for them. And so the next quote here, God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This work is of God, or it is not. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. My work bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway mark, no halfway work in the matter. The testimonies are the spirit of God or of the devil. That's pretty strong, isn't it? So are we free to pick and choose from her writings? She's making it very clear that we aren't, right? Now pay, clo pay close attention to these next statements here. Many times in my experience, I have been called upon to meet the attitude of a certain class. 
who acknowledged that the testimonies were from God, notice this, this is crucial, but took the position that this matter and that matter were Sister White's opinions and judgment, opinion and judgment. This suits those who do not love repro reproof and correction, and who, if their ideas were crossed, have occasion to explain the difference between the human and the divine. If the preconceived opinions or particular ideas of some are crossed in being reproved by testimonies, and sadly, I have seen this quite a number of times, unfortunately, especially in recent years, they have a burden of once to make plain their position to discriminate between the testimonies, defining what is Sister White's human judgment and what is the word of the Lord. And one thing I've heard a number of times uh, from various people is that, oh, her writings have been altered. That quote that you're quoting, that was altered. Uh, I have yet to see them actually back up any of those claims, but... <laughs> Everything that sustains their cherished ideas is divine, and the testimonies to correct their errors are human, Sister White's opinions. Okay, another quote here. Do not by your criticisms take out all the force, all the point and power from the testimonies. Do not feel that you can dissect them to suit your own ideas, claiming that God has given you ability to discern what is light from heaven, and what is the expression of mere human wisdom? And probably many of you are familiar that many Christians are doing this to the Bible as well these days, that they're saying, oh, that was not inspired, that was, and, and this part is, and you know, and there's some that now don't believe that pretty much any of the New Testament was inspired, only a few words. Okay, if, going back to this quote here, if the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. Christ and Belial cannot be united. I believe that we must take Ellen White's challenges seriously. If her messages do not come from God, then we must reject her claim to be a messenger of God. However, if her messages are from God, then we must listen very, very carefully to what she says because to reject her message is to reject God's message. <clears throat> These are some very clear and powerful statements we just read from Ellen White, but we are still left with a couple other statements of hers that seemed to, be, seemed to many to be saying something else. Here's the first of these two statements. And this is called Part of Ministry Again, page 125. The Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. So what exactly does it mean that she was a lesser light? In answering this question, notice what these next two statements of her say. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the, hearts, upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word, yet but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has through the testimonies simplified the great truths. And isn't it a wonderful thing to have these great truths simplified? And in his own chosen way, brought, brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. And another quote here. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he, instructs, than he instructs them now concerning his will. Notice that, never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. So clearly, lesser light does not mean less important light. 
This means we must carefully define lesser light and greater light so that we will understand what the words mean and what they do not mean. Lesser light is not God being less serious in communicating with his people. Lesser light is not God speaking is not God speaking less clearly. Lesser light does not mean dimmer light or unreliable light or unimportant light or untrustworthy light. Lesser light does not refer to an inferior quality of inspiration. The messages given to Ellen White were just as much the word of God as the messages that that came through Isaiah or Jeremiah, but Ellen White's purpose is different. The purpose of the Bible is to reveal the plan of salvation to man. The purpose of Ellen White's writings is to reveal more clearly the plan of salvation, which is already contained in the Bible. She is not giving a new plan of salvation or adding to the plan of salvation. Ellen White simply reveals more clearly those areas of scripture that pertain to our time and to our needs. Thus her light is lesser in that it shines back upon the greater light. To further understand what lesser light and greater light mean, now turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 4 to 9. John 1, verses 4 to 9. I'm sure we're all very familiar with this. Definitely one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and likely yours as well. Okay, starting at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true... Yeah, sorry. Okay, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So was John a light to those around him? Most certainly he, he was, but he was only a lesser light, reflecting the greater light, which is the Jesus, the Son of Righteousness. In the same way that the moon is a lesser light to the sun, reflecting the light of the sun. The prophets, of, the prophets over the centuries were all lesser lights and cannot be compared to the cumulative light that shines from the scriptures that contain all of their writing and that together perfectly reveal Jesus and the plan of salvation. Jesus is the greater light and Jesus is the word because the word of the scriptures reveals Jesus. Thus the scriptures containing all of the cum- accumulated light from all the Bible writers is also the greater light because it reveals Jesus. Ellen White is one prophet writing near the end time, end of time, compared to the many prophets collected within Scripture. Lesser light is lesser in relation to the greater cumulative light of many prophets shining through the books of the Bible. Let's now address the second of those two statements that has perplexed and confused many. And this is First Selected Messages, page 35. When I was last in Battle Creek, I said before a large congregation that I did not claim to be a prophetess. Twice I referred to this matter, intending each time to make the statement, I do not claim to be a prophetess. If I spoke otherwise than this, let it Let all now understand that what I had in mind to say was that I do not claim the title of prophet or prophetess. Okay, that sounds pretty conclusive, right? She does not claim to be a prophet or prophetess. But what what did Ellen White mean here? Since the fact that she received many messages, visions, and dreams from God over many years would appear to clearly show that Ellen White was a prophet. To understand what is going on, let's see what she says further. 
And this is in the same books for selected messages. And I'd encourage if you if you all haven't read the especially the first the couple uh, chapters, I guess the the first chapter of first selected messages is all about the uh, inspiration of the Bible, and then the next uh, chapters are all about the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. Early in my youth, I was asked several times, "Are you a prophet?" I have ever responded, "I am the Lord's messenger." I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have made no claim to this title. My Savior declared me to be his messenger. So what does that mean, that she is her, his, God's messenger? Let's look at the next quote here. My commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does not end there. It embraces much more than the minds of those who have been sowing the seeds of unbelief can comprehend. Ellen White was much more than a prophet. She was God's messenger. So what does that mean, that she was God's messenger? If we look in the Bible, we will see two other people that had a very similar role to Ellen White, as, as Ellen White had. To discover who one of these people's, people is, turn with me to Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Numbers 12, verses 6 and 7. Okay, starting at verse 6 here. <clears throat> oh, just one second. I need help. Oops. need a little sip. <clears throat> okay, starting at verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and, on, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. And actually, let's read verse 8. Uh, With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall, be, shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So here we see that Moses was much more than a prophet. He had a much greater work than that of just a prophet. And now let us turn to Luke 7, 26 and 27 to learn of the other person uh, that had the same role. So Luke chapter 7 and verse 26 and 27. Okay, and starting at verse 26. But went, what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before the, thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So once again, we see here John the Baptist being described as much more than a prophet. And we're probably familiar with how Jesus said there was never a prophet greater than John the Baptist. So when we look closely at these three individuals, we discover some amazing similarities. Moses helped deliver God's people from bondage in Egypt and led them to Canaan, the promised land. John the Baptist helped deliver God's people out of slavery to sin and the darkness they were in and pointed and led them to Jesus, their Savior and Messiah. Ellen White helped deliver God's people out of the darkness and false doctrines of the dark ages and is leading and preparing God's people for deliverance from this earth and into the heavenly Canaan. Uh, Malachi 3, verse 1, and Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, which we read for our scripture, apply to both John the Baptist and to Ellen White, speaking of how John would prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus, and Ellen White would help prepare the way for the, for the second advent of Jesus. 
A major part of each of these individuals' ministry was also lifestyle and health reform. Another key similarity is that Moses, John the Baptist, and Ellen White all show up around the end of a time prophecy. It's very interesting how at the beginning and end of every time prophecy, God always raises up a prophet. Moses was at the end of the 400-year sojourn in Egypt. John the Baptist was close to the end of the 70-week prophecy. And Ellen White was at the end of the 2300 Day prophecy. God gave instru- uh, sorry, Moses gave instructions on building the sanctuary and on the sanctuary services. John prepared the way for Jesus to leave his earthly ministry and go to the heavenly sanctuary. And Ellen White gave instructions on building up our body temple, our body sanctuary, the place where God always wanted to live. My brothers and sisters, we have been given exceedingly precious messages from God in the writings of Ellen White. Without this light, God's people would likely have never, would have, sorry, would likely have remained hopelessly entangled in the false doctrines that those who rejected that light still remain in. These messages were also sent specifically for the people still sorry, were for the people living just prior to the second coming and especially for the generation that will be alive at the second coming. God knows that in these last days when mankind is most degraded, both physically and spiritually, that it would be vital for us to receive this light. This is a time when temptation, temptations are multiplied like never before. Disease is rampant. And the devil is using a thousand different ways to deceive the world. False doctrines are spreading like wildfire in our church today. But it is largely because we have neglected studying the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, which I prefer to call the spirit of prophecy because they aren't her thoughts and opinions, but messages directly from the Holy Spirit. Notice what she says here in these next quotes here. I saw the state of some who stood on present truth, but disregarded the visions. So they even stood on present truth, but they disregarded the visions, the way God had chosen to teach, in some cases, those who erred from Bible truth. I saw that in striking against the visions, they did not strike against the worm, the feeble instrument that God spoke through, but against the Holy Ghost. That's serious business. I saw it was a small thing to speak against the instrument, but it was dangerous to slight the words of God. If they were in error and God chose to show them their errors through visions and they disregarded the teachings of God through visions, they would be left to take their own way and run in the way of error and think they were right until they would find it out too late. Then this is tragic. May none of us uh, go down this path. Then in the time of trouble, I heard them cry to God in agony. Why didst thou not show us our wrong, that we might have got right and been ready for this time? Then an angel pointed to them and said, My father taught, but you would not be taught. He spoke through visions, but you disregarded his voice. And he gave you up to your own ways, to be filled with your own doings. So if we understand that and believe that Ellen White was a messenger of God, it's not optional for us to be uh, reading and heeding these words, is it? Next quote here. Those who are indifferent to this light and instruction must not accept to Ex- expect to, ne- to ben, can't talk. <laughs> must not ex- expect to escape the snares which we have been plainly told will cause the rejectors of light to stumble and fall and be snared and be taken. And one more quote here. 
Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan, the very last. Do we believe we're living in the last days? So we can expect this to be happening. Do you see this happening? I know I sure am. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. So speak to me. What are some ways that we can make of none effect the spirit, the testimony of the Spirit of God? Ignoring. Ignoring. Yeah. It's not denying the yeah, that's another way, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, picking and choosing, right? Absolutely. Uh, as I said earlier, declaring that some were altered. As soon as you say, oh, some were altered, and I've heard the same thing about the Bible. Oh, the, some, things were, some verses were added to the Bible. As soon as you do that, you're making yourself the judge of what is inspired and what isn't. Exactly. Yeah, so it's a very easy escape route. Oh, that was altered. <laughs> I can ignore that one. Okay, yeah, I don't like that one. That was altered too, <laughs> and so forth. Okay, and going on. Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I have yet to see any any actual evidence that any of Ellen White's writings have been altered. I have heard many claims, but if anyone wants to claim that, show me because I. I have not seen that yet. Yeah, the same thing with the Bible. We, I mean, there have been, in the Bible, there have been minor uh, translational errors that have been made, but not changes in doctrine. Um, you know, there might be a word or two here, a little bit like that, but not changes in doctrine. Okay, so where was I here? So making none of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And now the next quote here. There will, be, there will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. Another quote. It is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. And I think it's, we need to know the, the plans of the enemy. I think it's very vital uh, so that we, we, we need to, that's always important when we're doing battle. Next follows, so, we, so that is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. Next follows skepticism in regard to the vital points of our faith, the pillars of our position, then doubt as to the holy scriptures, and then, and then the downward march to perdition. And I have seen this happen too many times. When the testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this, and he, re and he redoubles his efforts till he launches them into open rebellion, which becomes incurable and ends in destruction. Okay, one more quote here. The Lord came to me in the night season and spoke precious words of encouragement concerning my work repeating the same message that had been given me several times before. With regard to those who have turned from the light sent them, he said, in slighting and rejecting the testimony that I have given you to bear, it is not you but me, your Lord, that they have slighted. <clears throat> as I said before, that's serious business. <clears throat> These messages were given of God to keep us from being deceived by false doctrine and to prepare us to be a part of the 144,000. Those who are virgins, being pure, having no false doctrine and none of the world within them. Following the Lamb wherever he leads them and having no guile in their mouth and being without fault, having been so cleansed and refined by their master, 
that they are perfectly reflecting his character. My friends, God never needlessly sends his people messages. If he gives a message, it is because he knows that his people desperately need to hear and heed that message. And that's, that's another argument that I have heard. Well, Ellen White also said that if God's people had read the Bible as they should have, they would not have needed the spirit of prophecy. So I've heard that used as an excuse to not read the spirit of prophecy. But by the very fact that the spirit of prophecy was given show, shows that we need it. <laughs> we desperately need it. My brothers and sisters, let us not today continue to be as Israel of old, who ignored the prophets, ridiculed them, and even stoned them. And I think there's probably been some stoning, not literal, but there's been a lot of stoning that's gone on over the last year, number of years. It is just as ser serious a sin for us to ignore and not heed God's prophet today as it was 3,000 years ago. The wonderful thing, though, is that God only gives us messages and counsel for the pur purpose of blessing us not making our lives more miserable, that we can't do this and can't do that. Many in the Adventist church grew up with a very negative view of Ellen White, having much the same attitude toward her as most Christians in, outside of our denomination have toward the law of God. The truth is, though, is that on the unconverted heart will only ever see God's law and counsel as restrictive and a burden. If an unconverted person is sharing spirit of prophecy quotes, it will not be done in the right spirit. And likewise, if, one hear, if the one hearing the, the quotes is not converted, they will not receive them in the right spirit. My friends, we all need desperately a new heart and mind that will love the counsel of God and gladly welcome it. I hope and pray that this study today has been as much a blessing for each one of you as it was for me as I study into the subject. I tell you, I was immensely blessed as I learned much more fully the proper function of Ellen White's writings. May each one of us dil diligently study and heed these precious messages of God. And for any of you who might be unsure of whether she was a prophet of God or not, I encourage you to read what she actually wrote. What, read what she wrote. And test her with the tests given in the Bible. I guarantee that you'll be glad that you did and you'll be richly blessed. May God bless each one of you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Randy Haynes. Let us close our worship after hearing those stirring words today. What heavenly music, number 452. I invite you to stand as we sing once more to our Creator God.
Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you will now take us by the hand, hold us close to you, leading us in righteousness and making us to be a light to those in darkness. Lord, bringing the, uh, those in captivity out of their prison, Lord, and leading them to you. Go with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.